13.4, sampling terminology and key concepts. We've been talking about a lot of sampling terminology and we're going to try to put a lot of these ideas together in this section. Um, I have space for you here to draw a population and parameter picture and a sample and statistic picture and then space for notes. And what I'm going to do is give you a brief PowerPoint about sampling terminology and because I could make some, some pictures a little bit easier. So I'm going to show you that right now. So here's my cover page. Isn't that pretty? And to start off with, we're talking about a population. That is the entire group of people from which you want data or you want to make conclusions about. And a parameter is a numerical piece of information that you want to have about a population. So parameters go with population. And for example, a population would be all ENMU students and a parameter, something we want to know about the population, is the number of hours worked each week, and that's per student. Then another example would be the population would be all wild turkeys in New Mexico, and the parameters that we would maybe measure for these wild turkeys are wing length and weight. Target population. We talked briefly about that in the last lesson. This is the population for whom the survey applies. And we call it target population because it helps you in your mind think about focusing in on I'm only interested in people who are going to vote in the election coming up or say I am only interested in the elk in New Mexico. I don't care about the elk in Colorado. I don't care about the elk in Montana. I want the elk in New Mexico. So it helps me focus in that that's the group that I want to make conclusions about. So that's my target population. That's the population for whom my survey applies. Who or what do you want to make conclusions about? And my examples were voters who will vote in the upcoming election and that you need to understand is not the same as the registered voters because not all registered voters actually go to vote and it can be difficult to predict and that's often the case. We, we may know that's who our target population is but we don't know exactly who belongs to it in this case. The elk in New Mexico um, that's like I said it's not the elk in Colorado or Montana or anywhere else that has elk and it can be difficult to count how many elk we have and we'll look at some strategies for counting populations of wild things so we can estimate their numbers. Sampling frame. A sampling frame is a subset of the population and it is where the sample is chosen from. The best situation is that if my sampling frame is the same as my target population, meaning every member of my target population is in my sampling frame. And that's often not possible. So say we want to, thinking about the elk in New Mexico, say my target population is all the elk in New Mexico, and my sampling frame maybe is all the elk in the Gila wilderness because I can't physically go across the entire state with the amount of money I have for my study, so I'm going to confine it to a smaller region and where the elk are accessible. So I can go into the maybe a part of the Gila wilderness and go to where I think the elk are going to come. Um, so in that case, I have the next best situation. I'm trying to limit my sampling frame but I'm hoping that that's not going to affect my survey. So for my wild elk, I know that if I look at a big wilderness area and try to access every elk in that wilderness area and randomly choose from those elk, that that should be representative of the elk in New Mexico because it's a fairly limited region and there shouldn't be great differences. Now, if, for example, I take the elk in New Mexico and my target population is the elk in the United States. So between New Mexico and then going all the way up the Rockies. So if I'm looking at elk in any of those regions as my target population, who I'm trying to make conclusions about, 
just looking at elk in New Mexico could cause problems because the, the elk here may have very different habits and habitats and diseases and size even than say elk in Montana or anywhere else where you're going to find elk. So we have this issue of where are we looking and is it really going to be representative when we're talking about our sampling frame. So sampling frame is the sample of the subset of the population from which our sample is chosen. So I think I have pictures and I keep wanting to draw you a picture. Um, let's take a look at the next one. If I'm looking at a sample, then once I've talked about my target population, who I want to make conclusions about, my sampling frame is the subset of the population that I choose my sample from, and then from there I actually choose a sample, then the, the subset, this is going to be a subset of my sampling frame, and I'm going to use one of these statistical methods to choose my sample. And these are ones we've talked about, and there are others too, but the ones that we focused on are the quota, convenience, random, and stratified random. Okay, for a sample then, a statistic is the numerical information that you collect from the sample. So it's an estimate of the parameter and that was of the population. So I'm helping you with some words and thinking how they relate to each other, but the parameter goes with the population, so p, p they both start with P. Sample, statistic, sample, statistic, they go together as well. So a statistic is the numerical information you collect from the sample. It's an estimate of the parameter, and we only collect from the sample, not from the whole population, and we use it to draw conclusions about the whole population. And that's the beauty of it. Instead of, instead of finding and tagging every single elk, throughout the entire Western United States and then making um, data collection from all those elk, we can choose a representative sample of elk and collect data from just them. That would be the statistic and then use the statistic to estimate our parameter for all the elk in the population. Okay. I'm Talking about another example here, maybe I'll get off those elk and talk about something else. Um, a population example would be all students at Eastern, all ENMU students. And a parameter I'm interested in is the number of hours the students work in a week. And this would be all students and the number of hours they work in a week. Now I could go to every single student and talk to them, but that's going to take a lot of time and money, so instead, I want to choose a sample of 60 ENMU students and I want to use random sampling so they will be randomly selected and the statistic that I'm going to collect is the same thing as the parameter, the number of hours that a, the students worked each week, but it's just asking the students in the sample, how many hours do you work a week? So I'm talking to 60 students instead of the entire student body, 5,855 students. Okay, and then I can make a conclusion about my population. So I can say, NMU students work an average of 30 hours per week. I can say something like that. And it's because of the results I got from my sample, I can make a conclusion about my population. Am I right? Probably not exactly right. But because I used random, random um, selection for the people in my study, and I have a fairly good sample size, 60 is really good, then I'm more likely to come up with accurate data. But if I choose a different sample and I have 60 students in that sample, I probably wouldn't come up with the exact same number as I came up with from my first. I could get 35. It should be in the same ballpark as what I'm getting for the, the 60 students that I did talk to. Okay, so sample, statistic, they go together. Population, parameter, they go together. And a sample is a subset of the population. Oops, now we have some pictures. See if these help a little. So population and parameter. 
So the population, again, all ENMU students, parameters, number of hours they work a week, classification, age, what country they came from, if they're full or part-time, and we could go on and on. There are a lot of bits of information that we might be interested in about our ENMU students. Then a sample and statistic. So we have a sample. We are our ENMU students, that's our population still, the parameters still, but here's our sample, here's how it fits in. It's 60 of those ENMU students in our giant population. So it's a subset. So if I have here's my big population, a small set of them is my 60 students, and the statistics or the information I collect from those 60 students would be like the number of hours they work in a week. I might also collect the country of origin from those 60 students. And whatever else I wanted to, I could collect this entire list of parameters that I have for my population, but it's only from the 60 students, not from my entire population. That's what makes it a statistic. Okay, this is a good example of a, a picture that you might want to draw in your activity guide as well. All right, so all this about populations and parameters and samples and statistics, and there is a downside to sampling. And the downsides are the error that we could have. It is not perfect, as I mentioned before. When we take a sample, we are not talking to everybody, and so our numbers would be usually are off a little bit from our population. And sampling error is defined to be the difference between a parameter from our population and a statistic, okay? So you're going to have a difference between what the population would say and what your smaller sample said, okay? We can only estimate the error because we don't usually do a census and a survey. If we're going to do a census, that's all we do. If we're going to do a survey, it's because we couldn't afford to do a census, so we don't do both. So we can't know what the error is, but we know it's we can't know the actual error, but we know it's there, and we know a lot of times we can't prevent it. So here are the two causes of error. One of them is chance error, and that's because we are using a sample not taking a census. And no matter what, we're going to have chance error, and the, what we call that is sampling variability. Um, when we take a sample, so let me describe that, sampling variability. And that is that if we took, say, three different samples, Each sample could have slightly different results from one another. So even if we take, we do perfect job choosing our sample and we find out, say, the average number of hours a student works in a week, so we have it from that sample, and then we take another sample and we ask them the same thing, what's the average number of hours you work in a week, and then we compare the two samples, they're not guaranteed to be the same, and they probably won't be the same, but they should be, like I said before, they should be in the same ballpark. Okay, one other issue here that is a sampling error, and that would be sample bias. And that was when our sample was not representative of the target population. 
Okay, and that's for things like, remember representative was one of our words from before, that if a sample is representative, it means that every person or every elk had an equal chance of being included in the sample. And so if you're doing something that's excluding certain groups of people, then your sample's not representative, and we call that sample bias because there's error because of that. So chance error, it's because the sample only approximates the population, and I told you this too early, sampling variability, different samples, if you chose three samples, they're likely to produce different statistics for the same population, and even when you use the same methods to choose your samples, you're still going to have sampling variability. And here's the thing, chance error is unavoidable. You're going to have it. So anytime I ask you what kind of error is likely to be in this sample, it's always got chance error, always. There could be other error types as well, but chance error is always there. We minimize it by being careful when we select our samples, and we minimize it by having a good sized sample. Sample bias, that's from choosing a bad sample, and the sample is not representative of the entire population, it's often difficult to avoid. We're going to have a little bit of that no matter what we do, but it is preventable and we want to use proper methods of sample selection to prevent this. So the type sample bias is going to come from convenience, samples, and quota samples especially. And the reason we're getting them there is because we're not giving every person an equal chance to be in our sample. And let's go back for a second. If we come to chance error, um, we will have chance error in random and stratified samples. Remember that they were the lowest bias and they were better and best on our ranking they still are and there is chance error. We are going to have some sampling variability from one sample to another that's been chosen and we are going to have error because it's a small group not the entire population. But we minimize it. Remember we, we are very careful about choosing our samples and we use appropriate sample sizes. So we minimize it as much as we can but we know there will be some error there. Some, not a lot. Okay. So chance is small and it's not a lot. Sample bias is bigger and it's from using a bad sampling method, convenience or quota. All right, so let's talk then about sample size. So remember we use big N. And there it is, big N for the population size. And then we use little n for the sample size. So we use the same variable, one is uppercase and one is lower for us to talk about which, how big our sample or population is. We can use a sampling proportion by taking n, the little n divided by the big N, and multiply by 100. It just tells you what percent your sample is of your population. And sometimes we can't tell what our little n is or what our big N is. And let's talk about that just a bit, because I ask you that on tests. I like to ask you that. We'll, we'll talk about that just a little bit more. Um, we don't use the sampling proportion that much because it's more important to know the actual size and how you chose your sample. So if you're doing a public opinion poll, you want to talk to between 1,000 and 1,500 people. You want it to be random or stratified. And if you have, this is your little n, if your little n is that, then you're going to have a fairly small margin of error, but remember you're going to have a chance error. And we're minimizing it by using a large enough n. Okay, when we're talking about other types of samples that aren't public opinion polls, we can have much smaller n and still have an accurate sample. So when we're doing like studies that we'll talk about later in the hospital and things like that, you can have a sample size as small as 30 and you're good. So yeah, the n's, 
sometimes we can't tell what our ends are going to be though. And, and some of the examples, if you don't know what your, sam what your population size is, that's generally because it's hard to count. And for example, it could be the number of cockroaches in the United States. And any bug you could use as an example of when you don't know the population size. We can estimate it, but it's changing constantly, so it's very difficult to tell. And then times when you can't know your sample size would be um, when you're going to do a capture of fish in the wild and you don't know how many you're going to catch and you only have three days to do it so however many you catch after three days that's your sample size so there are times when it's difficult to know what your sample size will be another example with people would be if you're doing a convenient sample and you're standing outside the mall, you don't know how many people are gonna walk up to you and so you don't know what your in is. Another example with people would be if you're doing a volunteer study. You can't make people do medical studies. You have to rely on volunteers. I mean, it's one of the ethics that we have for, for doing clinical studies. We'll learn more about that later, but if you're doing a study uh, to determine if a new drug works, you can't just take everybody who comes to the hospital and automatically put them on this new drug that you're trying out. They have to agree to participate. So they have to volunteer, and you don't know how many volunteers you're going to get. But once they do volunteer, then there's things that we do to make it a good study, and we'll talk about that more later. But I just wanted you to know, sometimes you don't know, even when it's people, how big your sample will be.